This video is going to be a tier list for raw explosiveness. So it's gonna be about 58 to 60 exercises. Exercises I think are good or meant for raw explosiveness or what people think actually develop your explosiveness as an athlete. And I'm going to be saying either F tier, D tier, C tier, S tier. This is not the same as athleticism tier list, all right? If we're going for raw athleticism, durability also matters and health matters, right? If we're doing raw explosiveness, there's gonna be a lot of different exercises that matter. But also, if we're talking about general athleticism, some exercises might be too dangerous because of how potent they are in the body that it's not even worth it in putting an S tier. So for example, a def jump might go in S tier for this tier list, but for like general athleticism, for health, for longevity, that might be in like C tier, right? But for raw explosiveness, it's probably S plus tier. So in a program or when you're putting together a workout, other aspects matter and you can't only just go, let's grab the top 10 raw explosiveness exercises, all the ones in S and S plus tier and think that's gonna do something for you. Every exercise has its own purpose within a program and have its own way in this entire aspect of a three month or a four month block, okay? Other than that, a lot of boring stuff. Let's just get straight into it. The first one we see right here is lunge jumps. Okay, oh my God, I'm nervous, oh my God. Okay, lunge jumps, we'll put B tier, okay? The purpose for lunge jumps is actually if you do it in an extensive way. So if you do lunge jumps for three to five minutes in a row, with the low intensity, so you're not going max effort, but you're going, you know, maybe just like 30% of your, your max effort or 50% of your max effort jump, you actually can build extensive ability in the tendon, the patella tendon, which is something you can't really get a lot. So the reason why this matters is let's say you're trying to dunk off a of one foot or a two foot jump or you're a high jumper. When you're sprinting, you're building up momentum for a dunk. You have to decelerate all that momentum and a lot of the forces go to the patella tendon. If the patella tendon cannot handle those forces, all the pain is gonna go from the knee to the shin. And then once the pain goes to the shin, your leg's going to give out because your shin is not strong enough to handle those forces. It shouldn't be, it's not meant to be that. Your quad should be handling the majority of the forces. So doing extensive plyometrics that are knee dominant are actually really, really important for building that strength in the tendon so you can bring in more horizontal velocity or horizontal speed into your jumps. So if you wanna dunk, these are some things you can do every single day at a very low intensity that will be really, really helpful for your jump. Okay, well, for sprinting, not so much, but for raw explosiveness, this is pretty decent. B tier, maybe A tier, but it depends on how I go about this whole thing. All right, the next one is calf raises. Kind of want to do C tier, I might do B tier. If we're doing weighted calf raises, I think for raw explosiveness, we'll go C tier. Now, the reason why I say calf raises are C tier for raw explosiveness is because the velocity of the contraction so how long it takes you to get to the top of your toes is too slow to transfer over to your sprinting. So the purpose of developing the strength in the calf is to develop a lot of the miniature foot in the muscle, which will help with elasticity and injury prevention, but that's more of a general aspect versus raw explosiveness. So you're gonna build strength and you could do a thousand calf raises in a day or weighted calf raises, and you will be more durable in the foot but you won't see raw explosiveness gains. We'll, we'll get into it later, but you'll see more of the raw explosiveness from calf jumps versus calf raises. Okay, so think about heavy, heavy strength exercises like a weighted calf raise or multiple reps, you know, 100 reps of a calf raise a day like you've probably seen from some random YouTuber who said that. Those are more for durability. And when you have more durability, you can train more, which if you can jump more, that's good, but it's not contributing to raw explosiveness. So I'm gonna go C tier. I think it's a little bit overrated. I think the single leg calf raise is a lot better, but we'll talk about that later as well. Also too, with the calf raise, it's really easy to utilize muscles that you don't need to utilize because you're going so heavy. When you go with a single leg calf raise, you can really focus, especially if it's a strict calf raise, which just means no momentum at all. You can really utilize all the FS, uh, FSH or FHHC muscles or FCH muscles in the, the foot, which was kind of like the main benefit, right? For developing the fascia and elasticity okay this is i'm pretty sure backwards sprinting for raw explosiveness we'll go c tier backwards sprinting is good for once again injury prevention you're getting a lot of load in the patella tendon so if you're trying to be, have durable knees then backward sprints will help with that and obviously you'll train you'll, you'll train the quad a little bit which could be good for like some two foot jumping or some quad dominant jumps but for the most part it's just not fast enough for raw explosiveness aspects, if that makes sense. I could see it being pretty useful for deceleration because 
when you decelerate, a lot of the lows go into patella tendon, so you develop kind of explosiveness in that direction. Could be pretty helpful. So actually, we'll move it up to B tier. We'll go B tier, okay? Med ball throws is really good for developing power or optimal power in triple extension. This is a chest throw, a med ball throw. What I'm talking about is when you're holding it without bending your arms and you're kind of scooping it and throwing it up over your head, not pushing it up. You're throwing it up, kind of like you would throw up like a hand clean or a power clean where you're kind of like up and back is a good way to explain it. Yeah, really good for power through triple extension. You can do a different, a bunch of different variations. You can do pause med ball throws, which is really good for people who are strong but not athletic. You can do reversal med ball throws where you just stand in place and you try to drop as fast as possible to, stre uh, to train the amortization phase and the stretch shortening cycle. So reversal med ball throws, I probably would say like low key S tier, but I have a variation of reversal med ball throws that are really good. But for like how most people use med ball throws, we'll do A tier. I think it's really, really good. Now we have our first S tier bounding. God, talk about bounding forever. Bounding is one of the most foundational exercises for developing raw explosiveness, elasticity, active stiffness in the ankle, tendon elasticity, because you want stiffness in the ankle, but you don't want stiffness in the tendon. Those are two different things. You might hear me talk about that a lot. You want tendon compliance and ankle stiffness. This develops both at the same time. That is almost impossible. An example of something that ruins this is when you're doing strength exercises like a calf raise why i say it's a little bit overrated is because you're developing tendon stiffness which you do not want and ankle stiffness you want tendon compliance you want it to be like a slingshot you do not want it to be stiff and rigid so that's where these type of exercises can pair very well with the calf raise really good so it develops max velocity speed it's going to develop the stiffness and and the elasticity at the same time this is kind of like a speed strength movement where you can develop a little bit of max velocity at the same time just because of the velocity of it and it's also really good for one foot jumps, like high jumping or dunking, because you're teaching your body how to decelerate and propel your body forward and up at the same exact time. Take a little pause to tech chat. Are we good? Fire? Which sport? We're doing raw explosiveness for all sports. Very general. General, 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 general. Just general explosiveness. Inch jumps are not going to hinder your growth? No, they won't. Parkour is a death jump. Does that stunt growth? Let's get back into it. Um, everyone say hi to Reese Fit. That is uh, the love of my life. Okay. Box jumps, had to do it. I'm sorry, actually, it's just gonna be so much hate, but oh my God, bro, okay. Let's explain box jumps. We're gonna talk about a, a topic called stress shielding, all right? Stress shielding is when you're shielding yourself from stress, so when you go to sport, you injure yourself. Think about somebody like Kevin Durant, right? We can look up uh, an example of Kevin Durant right here, where he just randomly tears his Achilles or injures himself Kevin Durant injury, Phoenix Suns. I spelled Phoenix wrongs. I don't care. I barely know English. Okay, let's mute this. Look at this right here. This is an example of stress shielding. All right. Yes, he he did twist his ankle. Okay, I get that. But when you shield yourself from training on hardwood or training and landing, then when you go to sports, any little any little micro issue that happens, you're going to tear something. You're going to sprain an ankle. You're going to tear a tendon. You're going to tear your ACL. If you don't prepare your body with landing forces, which is think of a def jump or dropping off a box, landing forces, or think of you dunk a basketball and you land. If you never prepare your body to land, then you're going to get injured when you have to land. If you do box jumps and you box jump for a year and then you can dunk, and it's your first time dunking and you land from 30 inches in the sky, you're going to tear something. You have to expose your body to these eccentric forces or you're going to get injured. So box jumps, the purpose is let's just jump and 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 because we're jumping so high, we're jumping, let's say, let's say we're jumping a 50 inch box jumps, especially like dude, we're talking about like high box jumps. Those are completely F tier because people are like, okay, I have a 50 inch vertical jump because you're landing and all you're doing is driving your knees up. If you can't straight leg the box, that's not your vertical jump. I mean, completely straight leg the box. That means it's not your vertical jump. So if you're landing in a deep squat or a half squat, I can name someone who does these all the time, but <laughs> I'm not even gonna do it. Uh, if you're landing in a deep squat or half squat, that's not your vertical jump. Number one, that's risk of injury because what if you fail it and you fall? And then also you're stress healing because you're not landing on any type of hardwood, surface, grass. A good replacement for box jumps would be max effort jumps, a dunk. All right, it's the same thing. You're jumping to a destination. A box is a destination. A dunk is a destination. That's the goal. You're jumping to a goal, but instead you're landing and introducing those forces. The only time I'll say box jumps are B tier or C tier is if, let's say, you have knee pain and you need to, 
you want to get in jump volume and practice maybe your technique, but you do not want to land on something, then, I'll, okay, I'll say D tier. It has a purpose. It does have a purpose. But for the most part, there's no reason to do it. If anything, it could hurt you in the long run, okay? Especially if you're doing these high squat, high jump squats, you're landing in a deep squat. I know the first person to look up, this is the, I'm not trying to hit on them. This is an example of like completely F tier, like F minus tier is this shit right here. No hate to him at all. This, this is F tier. I didn't even have to look at it. First try, bro. First try. This is F tier. No hate to him at all. I love Adonis, but this is F tier. This is F minus. This is like, what's, what's after F, right? This is, this is like completely bullshit. It's terrible for your vertical jump. It's dangerous. You're not getting max intent. It's just not it, right? It's just not it. I'm sorry. I ranted for way too long. Okay. What is this? A power snatch? Okay. Power snatch. So this is an Olympic lift variation where you're throwing the barbell up to pretty much above your head, right? You're like literally like throwing it up and landing like this. We'll go C tier. Okay. You could do D. I'm not going to lie. I wouldn't lie. I'm going to go D tier. I think it's, it can be good. Actually, uh, okay, no, no, no. Okay, C tier, I think it's good for raw explosiveness. I think the technique is so difficult that um, for 90% of the population who's not going to spend a month on trying to learn technique, when they also have to learn basketball skills, they need to learn how to shoot, they need to learn how to sprint, they need to learn how to dribble, they need to learn how to dribble a soccer ball, a basketball, um, learn how to catch a football, spending time in the weight room trying to learn how to power snatch when you could just do a high pull or a, different, or a loaded jump and get the exact same benefit, it's not worth it. OK, so and also to get max intent, you have to go very, very high in um, the weight. Right. You need to go, I think, in the research, like 90 percent plus. So when you're going to these super heavy weights, 90 percent of your one rep max, what happens when you get there? Those are injuries. Right. I'm going to say the same thing for power cleans and hand cleans. When you start going to these 90 percent plus ranges, those are injuries. Guess what we can do without 90 percent load? We can do loaded jumps with 10 percent of your body weight and get the exact same effect. You can look it up in the research is the exact same effect. OK, overrated. I'll honestly put it in D tier. Trap bar high pull, A tier, A tier, A tier, A tier, A tier. This is a power snatch, a hand clean, a power clean without any need to learn skill. There is no skill. You grab the trap bar and you throw it up. All right. There's no skill, but you get crazy explosiveness games, crazy power development, crazy development in the glute, in the hamstring, in the calf, all at once with no, no skill floor, without a skill floor or skill ceiling. There's no skill. You just throw it up. All right, great for general explosiveness, completely fire. We'll go half squat, A tier. Uh, this is a barbell half squat. So like what I mean by half squat is like heavy, heavy half squats. Not, I just couldn't find a good exercise, a good like, um, this is a, a jump angle specific squat, half squats. These are full defs. So when I say deep squats, I'm talking about these. This is a half squat, right? Box squats, half squats. These are half squats, right? There you go. You understand what I'm trying to say. Half squats, A tier. You're developing explosiveness at a joint angle specific, which is usually probably around two foot jump. So people's two foot jumps, if you're a power dominant jumper, you're probably going to jump from a half squat position, not parallels, a little bit above parallel. So this is actually a terrible photo for this, but uh, really, really important. All right. So you're jumping from a uh, half squat position, a little bit above parallel. And it also is really good for acceleration. All right. Acceleration, you're hitting knee angles, very similar to half squat. So um, A tier, not much to explain there. Hurdle jumps, Ooh, not S plus, but S. For raw explosiveness, you're developing elasticity, elastic power, elastic strength, your stretch shortening cycle, reversal strength. I can just name out a thousand benefits, um, especially when you add like a long hurdle jump. So there's different types of hurdle hops, right? You have the short hurdle hops where it's like four inches off the ground. And those are really good for max velocity sprinting and uh, quick pops up, pop offs. You're trying to develop more power, then you're going to go high hurdle hops. Where you have to drive your knee up and you know stay on the ground for a little bit longer. The ground contact times are gonna be like 0.2 to 0.4, versus like short hops are gonna be like 0.1 to 0.2. Right? These are really good. I say short hurdle hops are S tier, high hurdle hops are A tier. There you go for raw explosiveness. Band assisted jumps will go B tier. Really good for beginners. If you don't know how to produce force and maybe you're really strong, you just don't understand how to produce force. There's another type of exercise that's better than this, but I think this is really good for beginners. If you have knee pain, this is really good um, for raw explosiveness. Uh, some people are like, oh my God, it's developed sprint speed and develops like raw vertical jump. I wouldn't say that. It's more about like tendon tolerance, general elasticity, rate of force development to a sense. But because you're deloading your body, you're not really like producing force at a fast rate. You're just producing less force because your body weight's lighter. You know, so it's like it can get a little tricky with how we word things, but I would I would pass on that. So I'd say B tier. I used to think it was S tier, but I've changed my mind on that in the, in the most recent future. These are what skips for height. 
Skip for height will go B tier. Really good for developing um, raw one foot explosiveness. Good for high jumpers, for sprinters, you know, max velocity. What's cool about this is that you can access the early stance. Early stance is when your shin is vertical or negative. So think about acceleration, your shin is forward and then vertical. One foot jumps and max velocity sprinting is vertical, right? So instead of forward, it's just vertical. This develops those aspects, right? That early stance, force absorption when your your heel hits the ground and then when you're producing force your heels still i mean not your heel your heel is extending and then your shin is still vertical right so you're developing like those general aspects to be able to handle those forces in those angles with drills like these i didn't explain that well i'm very sorry i'm just all over the place right now what are these step up jumps okay this is a hard one i kind of want to go d tier but they're very similar to lunge jumps actually i kind of want to switch these okay Stevel jumps are really good for developing. I don't want to talk about this. Stevel jumps are very good for developing tendon strength in the patellar tendon, kind of like what we talked about for the lunge jump. I think what people usually use it for, for like one foot bounce and and sprint speed, that aspect, what people think step up jumps, really bad, especially when you do high step up jumps. So if the step up jump makes your leg go parallel like this. I don't know if you could tell. Her leg's almost parallel at the bottom position, which it is parallel. It's too high, right? When it's too high, it's like low-key F tier. When it's very short, let's say like 8 to 12 inches off the ground, I can put it at B tier, but most people are doing it like at a height that's way too high. The box is just way too high. At that point, it's just a muscle exercise where you're just developing the glutes, and even if you're jumping off of it, because you have such little range of motion to work with and produce force from, and the first half is so awkward because it's so slow, it's just not a power exercise. It doesn't really develop anything. It's just like a, a fast strength exercise. It's like the best way I can explain it. It's, it's honestly just bullshit, I don't know. Quarter squats, we'll go S tier. I don't really have a reason to explain this. It's like Ben Johnson, Carl Lewis, all the top sprinters of all time do quarter squats. Joint angle specific, uh, specific to max velocity sprinting, two foot jumps for elastic dominant jumpers. You're overloading the angle, so you can't do core squats and do fucking 135 pounds. You need to go like 20% above your own right max. Oh, same thing for half squats. Half squats, actually I'm putting an S tier because velocity half squats are very potent. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Velocity half squats are very potent. So regular half squats are good, they're A tier, but when you put up speed to it and you do 40 to 60% of your own right max, it's a very potent exercise for ver vertical jump and sprint speed and just general power. Quarter squats are the same thing, but this time, instead of going light, you want to go heavy. You want to go very heavy. 20% above your own rep max. Some people might say 10. Some people might say 30. Just do 20. All right, 10. Just do 10 or 10 to 20. Really, really good for developing strength in those joint angle specifics. Getting used to loads that you might not be able to, to squat. Like for me, I'm doing quarter squats with almost 500 pounds, right? I can't squat that. I can't deep squat that at all. But it even makes me squatting 400 pounds even lighter, right? So there's so many benefits. Strength benefits, general explosiveness, all that, right? Drop jump, we're going to go S tier, S plus. This, a drop jump is when you drop off a box and you pop off the ground fast, but you're still jumping high, right? So the floor is lava and you're being as reactive as possible. It's going to develop reactive strength, which is one of the most important things for your sprint speed and your raw explosiveness. Actually, we might put bounds in S plus as well for the exact same reason. Bounds is S plus and we're going to put this in S. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Bounding is definitely S plus and this is, they, they do the same thing. But the reason why bounds are better is because there's horizontal velocity, which means you have to decelerate, which absorb force at a much faster and harsher rate. It's much harsher on the body, so I wouldn't just spam these all the time, but they're definitely really, really potent. And drop jumps are also very potent. They also develop the central nervous system in a very good way that a lot of people need those benefits. Reactive strength, good for one foot bounce, max velocity sprinting, A tier. A tier, A tier, A tier. You're gonna develop acceleration very well, but that's really about it, right? So you're gonna teach your body how to produce horizontal power, which Honestly, it's really good. It Loki could go S tier, but I have something that's going to go S tier instead. If this is band resisted broad jumps, we're going S tier. Or we'll, we'll talk about it later. But band resisted broad jumps, S tier. You can develop horizontal power, force production, optimal power, general explosiveness, all the benefits you could think of. Very, very good. It has high correlation, extreme high, extremely high correlation, your max effort broad jump, the length of it to your acceleration 10 yard dash. And what 90% of athletes struggle with is their first 20 yards. People are trash at accelerating. If you're good at acceleration, it's probably natural. It could be genetic. It could be you broad jumping and being good at a squat, but you need this, right? You really, really need this exercise. You need to do this exercise very, very often. I program this all the time. I could put S tier, but I don't want to have a long ass S tier just because I'm being very easy, right? Resist sprints, S plus tier, 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 S plus tier. It's not even a question. It's not a question. You load that thing up 
10 to 20 percent of your body weight you will be one of the fastest accelerators you will develop horizontal power general explosiveness force production at fast speeds rate of force development this is one of the best probably the number one i'm not gonna say the number one but one of the best exercises to develop sprint speed let me explain it in a little bit deeper science so when you sprint you hit peak velocities at a very short range when you're not fast all right if you cannot run 10 7 that's what i mean by not fast all right you that doesn't mean you're slow i'm not calling people trash but let's i'm trying to give you guys a frame of what i'm talking about if you're running below 10 7 or a 5 point or 4.5 40 yard your peak velocity and below i mean like you're running 4.6 4.7 or you're running like 11 2 right so slower than those times your peak velocity fizzles out at five to 20, 10 yards right so what i mean is after probably three steps you've hit your max velocity so what a lot of people will say is i feel like i'm getting faster at the end or i feel like i start off fast like i'm a good accelerator but then at the end i fizzle out that's because you're hitting peak velocity so fast that you're not even developing momentum developing momentum is extremely important and the momentum comes from horizontal power horizontal angles you're running at 45 degrees and you're developing power into the ground developing force into the ground to propel you forward later on for max velocity if you cannot develop force into the ground at a horizontal angle so horizontal power at fast rates and it still needs to be fast then you are hitting peak velocity which is like your max speed at like 10 yards and when you hit your max speed at 10 yards guess what you still have another 80 yards to sprint or 90 yards to sprint or if you're running a 40 you still have another 30 yards to sprint you have another 30 yards of sprint and you hit your max velocity at the first 10 yards because you're slow and you can't produce horizontal force guess what you're gonna run a very bad time you need to be able to develop and continue to produce horizontal force at a horizontal angle for at least 30 to 40 yards some say 20 whatever let's shoot for 30 to 40. and the way you develop this aspect which is one of the most important things for your overall sprint is to stop yourself from peaking out the first 10 yards which i promise you all of you do if you cannot run 10 7 you are peaking out the first 10 yards which is terrible then you need resist sprints an alternative is hill sprints hill sprints s tier resisted sprints with a band or with sleds s plus hill sprints s tier when i talk about hill sprints this is what i mean hill sprints people think when i'm talking about hill sprints i'm talking about a certain thing all right this is a hill sprint all right this is what i mean a decent incline this is a little bit too much this is too much you should not be muscling your way up it should be a very gradual incline it should be very very calm incline it's kind of it's fishy it's hard to talk about because it's kind of subjective like this is too much right this is power hill strides yes yeah, too much this is a good example right here right these are too much this is way too much this is not going to develop your horizontal explosiveness this is just a muscle exercise this is for strength it's not going to develop your speed it's the same thing as doing like a, a, a sled push right but you want a slight incline a very very small incline this is a good incline this is very very small it's an incline very very small these are still good for horizontal power if you're running where i'm gonna put sled pushes i didn't add sled pushes i put them in b tier for general explosiveness remember this video is about general raw explosiveness this is probably b or c tier right honestly if this video is about raw explosiveness we're gonna put the half squat into a tier now that i'm thinking more about it okay band assisted sprints we're gonna put c tier only because none of you guys are gonna do it if you're if you're first of all you need someone to do it for you like you need someone to have a very long band and push you against or a 1080 and 1080s cost over ten thousand dollars so i promise you 90 percent of you guys are not gonna do it because there's not enough long bands that are cheap enough and 1080s no one's buying it right but if you can figure out how to do long sprints maybe you have like a lot of wind behind you it's just too dangerous raw explosiveness yeah like like i said like i'm not really factoring in the danger because you gotta remember for this tier list we're not factoring in danger or durability right we're just going like what is going to give you the best bang for your buck but still it's just not worth it i wouldn't ever suggest this for someone right and if we're not talking about danger yeah no no, no i wouldn't i still wouldn't change anything okay power clean same thing as a power snatch but i think it's better than a power snatch the skill is too high the skill floor is too high coaches some old head coaches you'll see in my comment section just teach the power clean right it, it's, it's not that hard to learn the power clean but just learn the power clean you need to learn the olympic it's not that hard it should only take you one session who cares some people are going to struggle with the skill how difficult the technique is and if we're learning thousands of other things like a lot of you guys in here want to be faster sprinters you do not need to be learning multiple things you want to know how many things you can learn at one time one your body cannot handle your brain i'm sorry your brain cannot handle more than one thing at a time so if you're spending a whole day trying to learn how to sprint and it's like okay let me teach you the power clean that might transfer to your sprint well all that all the the knowledge you learned about sprint technique and how to improve it that just went out the shitter 
Now your brain's confused because you're learning two things at once. So it's almost never worth it to teach the power clean. And then once again, for people who are like, you just need to learn it. Who cares? You just need to get, get it taught. Let's talk about injury risk. Because once we go to 90%, injuries happen. And that's the only way you get the same benefit as loaded jumps or a trap or high pull. In the research, it says you need to hit 90% of your one rep max to get max explosiveness gains. And the reason why you're getting max explosiveness gains is because of max intent, which helps with motor unit recruitment and rate of force development. You can get max intent in so many safer ways with the same exact benefit. This is B tier. I'm about to put it C tier because now I'm ranting and I'm starting to get irritated. But we're going to put this B tier because it's better than high snatch. Stair jumps, D tier, C tier. Could be helpful for horizontal power, but the amount of stress it gives to the Achilles tendon, not worth it. And for raw explosiveness, it's not even that good anyways. You could just do a drop jump or a bound. I don't even feel like talking about it for that long. 5v5 basketball, S plus tier. You, you know something I heard uh, a while ago was someone commented in my section and it was like a, a video of me. I transformed a guy. He went from not being able to touch... I think it was like not even touching backboard and I showed how he did the just jump program and he went from not touching backboard to dunking right it was a good dunk too it wasn't even like a like a bs dunk. it was like a solid dunk right he's like five foot seven when he did that I showed some progressions right some of my training philosophies and they said you know I'm five foot eight and I've been dunking for like 10 years and I didn't work out ever I just you know I just I was always able to dunk you don't need to do all this it's a waste of time to train and you know what he was kind of right but he didn't explain it well the reason why people can dunk without training is because basketball. When you play a 5v5 basketball, you're getting so much gains to your acceleration, to deceleration, change of direction, and your vertical jump. Have you ever thought about you boxing out somebody and trying to grab a ball for a rebound? Or are you jumping for a layup? A layup is a max effort jump. It's the same thing as dunking off one foot because you're trying to jump as high as possible, maybe slam on the backboard, like touch the backboard and lay it up like some people do. And you're getting off the ground, right? You're getting off the ground at fast speeds, right? You're sprinting to the rim and then jumping off as fast as possible to, you know, stop yourself from getting blocked. And you're jumping up as high as possible to stop yourself from getting blocked. And then let's think about when you finish a 5v5 basketball session, what do a lot of people do? Let's do a dunk session. Who can dunk? Let's just throw off our dunks. Let's throw lobs and see how high we can jump. These are this is all explosiveness training. This is all explosiveness training. And then you're defending someone. You're changing directions laterally. That's a lateral change of direction with a reaction, which is very, very intense on the body. You're decelerating. You're accelerating to catch up to the person to close out. You're, you have the basketball in your hand. You're, you're blowing past someone. You're doing a crossover. That's lateral explosiveness, acceleration. It is the best drill or exercise. If you are like, I don't want to train. I don't want to go in the weight room. I don't want to do plyometrics. I don't care about any of this bullshit. All this science doesn't matter. I don't care about science. I just want to jump higher. Go play 5v5. And then go do dunk sessions at least two to three times a week, about 10 to 30 dunks. And go play 5v5 consistently. Don't get injured. If you don't care about science, if I'm talking all this, just like, dude, I don't give a fuck about all this. I just want to jump higher. I don't want to buy any programs. I don't want to do anything. Go play 5v5 basketball. Do that shit for three months. You're going to improve. But is that going to be conducive to a lot of other things? Maybe not. If I were going to rank these, I'd probably put this first. Bounding, sec uh, bounding third, and then resist the sprints second. Deep squat, B tier. This is more of an injury prevention exercise. A lot of people get this completely mistaken, and I'm going to explain why deep squats do not improve raw explosiveness okay let's 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 start with the research joint angle specificity is you're producing the most force at the angles you jump from nobody jumps from a deep squat position if you're jumping from a deep squat position especially in basketball you fucked up all right let's get that understood if you are some, for some reason asked to grass in the middle of a basketball game you either got crossovered you broke your ankle or something fucking went wrong. You probably tore something if you were ass to grass in the middle of a basketball game. So if you're never going to hit ass to grass or even parallel in the middle of a basketball game, you're never going to jump from there. Why would you train from there? I'll give you a reason why. Injury prevention, right? You need to prevent injuries. What if that does happen, right? What if you do push your knee that far forward over your toes? Or what if you do have that much knee bend? Yeah, injury prevention. But for raw explosiveness, Especially when we start talking about the research, once you're past two years of training, this does almost nothing. It all does is develop compensations. It develops poor motor unit recruitment, which means how you fire your muscles. It can even kind of fuck up your rate of force development in a sense. Okay? And how and co-contractions, right? The way you co-contract, which is really important. So in the research, deep squats are really, really good for beginners. And this is where you'll see a lot of those like old head coaches preach deep squats and they'll die on the hill is because research does say deep squats improve 40 yard dash and vertical jump and it's a fact and they show the numbers 
But when you actually read research, you're not just reading headlines like what 90% of the population does. When you actually read the research, every single time deep squats improve someone's vertical jump, they were adolescents, they were new to training, or they're untrained males, college males who need $10, or a college, a college student who eats potatoes all day needed $100, so they joined a research, a research club or whatever, they joined one of the studies, and then they started doing deep squats and started training, because you don't only deep squat in these research papers, you actually do a full training program. So they finally started training, and they're usually a couch potato who played video games all day, and then they improved their vertical jump. If you are untrained, then yes, deep squats are good. But the more trained you are, you need to be very specific with the way you train, the angles you train. It's like like your explosiveness and the adaptations you make at the tendon level and at the nervous system level are very specific to the angles you train at. Even training, if you jump from a quarter squat but you train from a half squat, that low key might not transfer. You need to be very specific with the way you train, the way you jump, the way you sprint. Everything needs to be very angle specific once you fall out of this beginner range. Once you're an intermediate, two years of training, you've done a program for two years, you followed consistent training, you're not just doing random workouts, you need to let go of this deep squat. Do it maybe once or twice out the year, three three to four months out the year, but this should not be the meat and potatoes of your jump workout. I'm sorry I talked for that for way too long. Reaction tag, we'll go S tier. It's kind of like 5v5 basketball, but without the skill component. That's that's all I gotta say. The same benefits as 5v5 basketball without like the vertical jump aspect, but without the skill component of basketball. All right, 40 yard dash, S plus tier, timed 40 yard dashes. Uh, we'll go S plus and we'll go here. Well, yeah, we'll go here. A lot of people get mistaken is that 40 yard dashes just improve the technique. When you're running 40 yards, all you're doing is you're improving technique. When you run time sprints with no weight or assistance, whatever, nothing to it, it's just sprinting, you're actually improving raw explosiveness traits. You're improving tendon elasticity, you're improving rate of force development, you're improving relative power, motor unit recruitment, motor unit recruitment. Man, horizontal power, vertical force, force production, so many things, right? Ankle stiffness, tendon elasticity, tendon compliance. You're improving all these things. Literally every aspect of athleticism is improved with a 40-yard dash or any type of sprints. So no, it's not only improving technique. You are improving raw explosiveness, and it's probably one of the best ones at doing it, right? This is a max effort jump. We're going to put this in S plus tier. This is a high jump photo, but when I'm saying max effort jumps, I'm talking about dunking, I'm talking about anything with a goal, right? So jumping for a tennis ball, doing a high jump, doing a dunk session, these are amazing, right? Absolutely perfect. You're gonna develop the most important thing, which is usually jumping for a lot of people, right? You're developing the aspect itself. Like the goal itself, do the goal. 90% of the time, if you wanna jump higher, you need to jump. If you wanna sprint faster, you need to just sprint, right? Think about my program names. They're called Just Jump, Just Sprint for a reason, right? Don't complicate it. I know the research, I know the science, but let's keep it simple. Jump to jump higher, sprint to sprint faster, squat to squat more weight. It, it's, I, I can go into detail about all the science, but it's literally just that simple. Same thing as the sprints. Like a lot of people think jumping is the same, it's just improving technique. That's all you're doing. No, you're developing a lot of raw athletic traits, a lot of good raw athletic traits, very important ones, very specific to the sport. Hill sprints, we talked about this earlier. We'll go S tier. Resist it with a band or a sled resistance, which by the way, you can get a pretty cheap sled, like people. I know like money is hard these days, but like sleds, sprints, cheap. Go mow someone's lawn, go work a job and save some money up for a month and go get a $40 sled or go get a $10 sled or I mean $20 sled or go get a $20 tire sled. I'm not telling people that they're broke or whatever it is, but please work hard, find a way to make money and go get a sled. People always tell me I don't have sleds, go find a hill. I can't make money, it's physically impossible. I promise you it's not possible, especially in today's age. Go find a hill then. But this is a non-negotiable. Resistance sprints are non-negotiable. Complete non-negotiable. If you're slow and you want to get faster or you want to be more explosive in basketball, soccer, volleyball, these are non-tennis, whatever it is. Def jump. S tier. I need to rank these, by the way. Max over jump here. Resistance sprints here. Def jump here. Drop jump. Hurdle jump. We'll put hurdle hops over here. Reaction tag over this. We'll go reaction tag. Yeah, reaction tag at the top of S tier. Then def jump, hurdle hop, quarter squats will go at the bottom. Honestly, we could put quarter squats to A tier because it's still a strength exercise at the end of the day. So top of A tier, broad jumps, half squats. Okay. I don't feel like actually this is actually kind of perfect. Uh, we can actually do this. Actually, no, this, this, this can go here. There we go. Cool. Someone, something like this. It doesn't need to be perfect. 
What did I just say? Reaction tag. Def jumps, really, really important. You're developing amortization phase, reversal strength, which is really important. This could be a missing link for people. Def jumps and drop jumps can be a missing link for transition, transitional strength. So if you feel like you jump high from a standstill, but you can't bring in speed, this could be that missing link, okay? This could definitely be the missing link. It's also good for just general power, general explosiveness, reactive strength index, all those things. Tip races, F tier. This is our first F tier for today. Oh man, before I even get in here, we'll, we'll restart this. Let me just check the chat. Reaction tag, just tag. Sorry, I said reaction tag, I meant to say tag, my bad. I'm sorry, just like try hard tag. What's your third exercise in S tier? I'll read through all the exercises in a second. Okay, we're chatting. Oh my guys, pay attention and rewind the video. Basketball to the ground, quarter squats. You think I should just do... Okay, I'm sorry. There's a lot of questions. I want to answer it, but I don't want to... I'm on a roll right now, okay? Is the microphone okay? I think we're good. Okay, let's do tip raises. F tier. So don't get fooled by social media. That's all I'm going to say. Just because a coach said this is the best way to reduce knee pain, and he said it, and he said it in a good way. He said it with a good story. He explained it in a way that was so captivating that it just made you believe it. There was no research to back it up. There's no, re there was no research paper plattered on that screen. I promise you there wasn't. Go rewatch the videos you saw. There was no research in the caption. There was no research in the description. You wanna know why? This is a sad case of bro science, okay? Let's explain, because I'm gonna upset people. I understand I'm kind of being controversial. Tib raises is loading the tibialis. You have a tibialis anterior and the posterior. All right, both are important for different ways. And I wouldn't say never do tip raises, but there's some better versions. Like if you wanna really find a, a, a tip raise that's good, instead of doing weighted, you wanna do banded, band resisted. So it's still weighted, it's still resisted, but you do band resistance, you do a circle. That's gonna chain, uh, train different aspects of the tip because they're different muscles inside the tip. It's not just one huge muscle. And that would be more beneficial. That would probably be C tier or D tier. But for raw explosiveness, this does not help you jump higher. All you're doing is load the tip, all right? When you load, the tip works as a decelerator after the patella tendon and the quad, okay? And the, uh, technically the hamstring. The hamstring is number one, then the patella tendon second. So it's a decelerator for jumps, for horizontal momentum, right? So you're bringing in more momentum and you're decelerating with the hamstring first. It should be the quad and patella tendon second. That might be a little bit off in terms of timing. And then the tip would, would usually turn on and fire if your patella tendon is not strong enough. Remember that if your patella tendon is not strong enough. Well, let's keep going. When you do plyometrics, your tip is being trained up to four to four to six times your body weight, right? So if you're doing a plyometric drop jump, for, for example, which I, I look, should have mentioned this earlier, but you're resisting your body four to six to even sometimes 10 times your body weight when you're doing a drop jump. So the your, your body weight's multiplying when you drop from the air because of momentum, right? Because of gravity, I'm sorry. And momentum, same thing, whatever, all right? Because of gravity, you are withstanding so many forces to your tibs. That's all you need for strong tibs, okay? Now, adding tib raises on top of this, especially because of the resistance path. Remember, resistance path is how you actually perform the lift, right? The, the bar path is another way to look at it. Actually gives you a lot of overuse injuries in the tip. I think there should be research on this, and it'd be kind of funny if there isn't, because I was just making fun of how there, it's just bro science. Tib raises and overuse injuries injuries there probably isn't medial all right yeah you'll get medial tibial stress syndrome i know they're not talking about tip raises but this is the scientific term of the type of overuse injury you would get from um tib raises because of the bar path and the resist or the resistance profile when you do tib raises it's too much load that you're probably already getting from plyometrics so i'll put it in a better context if you're doing plyometrics and jumping this is f tier because the plyometrics sprinting and jumping is already enough load to the tibs that you don't need more. And if you do more, you will get a, a medial tibial stress syndrome, right? You'll get overuse stress injury, stress fracture to the shins. If you are a couch potato, you are, I'm not even gonna put an age, but you're a couch potato, you sit on your, your ass all day, you don't train at all, all you do is watch TV and you have shin splints, then these could be helpful. But let me explain shin splints. Oh, wait, actually, let me break down. This doesn't improve your vertical jump. I don't, I don't think, like, I think I explained that, right? Like, if you're using a tib as a decelerator, that means number one, if your shins are turning on when you're jumping, right, and they're they're getting irritated when you're jumping, that means number one, your shoes suck, number two, your hamstring's weak, and number three, your patella tendon's weak, and your glutes weak. Your, sh your shin should be the last line of defense. It shouldn't be getting activated so much when you're sprinting and jumping. Your patella tendon should be taking all the stress and it shouldn't be painful at all, which means it's a strong patella tendon from these type of exercises, right? So developing tendon tolerance is really important. So this shouldn't even be a factor, especially if you're sprinting and jumping, you're getting enough load to the tips, and it doesn't improve force production. 
If it's not improving explosiveness, because there's no stimulus to the central nervous system, it's too, it's a it's a it's a accessory lift. It's not a compound movement. So if it's not a compound lift, there's no there's no uh, stimulus to the central nervous system. And then it's um wow my brain just farted. It's not a compound movement, so no stimulus to the central nervous system. And then you're not producing force from the tip. You don't produce force from deceleration, right? If you're stopping your body, you're not producing force backwards. You're decelerating. You're absorbing force. So this doesn't improve raw explosiveness. You're not producing force at all. You never jump by pulling your toes up. You don't sprint by pulling your toes up. You, I mean, technically you pull your toes up, but that's to absorb force, correct? To be elastic. So your tendon is stretched and in, in an isometric position. So it can produce force at a faster rate, not to jump. So it's F tier. Maybe I didn't explain that well, but I'll, I'll do a presentation on it, okay? Jump rope, C tier, B tier, C tier, top of C tier. No, wait, it has to be B tier because I said calf raises are C tier, Never mind. Go well, actually, we'll, we'll, uh, I just changed my brain. Middle of B tier, really good if you do it at long periods of time, right? So you'll hear some people who are like, I dunked by just doing jump rope every day. They are correct. These are one of those exercises that if it's paired correctly with the right training program, like jump rope and basketball is like a really good mix. Or jump rope and just sprinting, like if those are only two exercises you picked is a really good combo because you're developing the extensiveness and the elasticity in the tendon and you're doing the max effort work. Or uh, just max effort dunks and then jump rope. You could literally do that for four weeks and improve your vertical jump because you're doing the max effort exercise that's very specific to the sport, and then building all the the general qualities in the ankle stiffness portion and in the tendons elasticity portion, which we know is important. So this kind of just is a, is a one trick pony. It kind of develops everything. It Loki is a tier, but before raw explosiveness is B tier. If this was like a general athleticism tier list, I probably put it S tier. But it develops, you know, tendon elasticity, ankle stiffness, reversal strength, your stress running cycle. So many things, so many things. I could just name thousands of benefits. But when you pair it with max velocity sprinting or max effort sprinting, max effort resistance sprints, um, or like a max effort dunk session, so like 30 dunks and then 10 minutes of jump rope. Remember, it has to be extensive. You can't do jump rope for 10 reps. You need to do five minutes minimum, right? Or it's not really going to make a, any adaptation at the tendon level. So you need to do five to 15 minutes, 15 minutes maximum. You do that every single day and just max ever dunks, you're going to dunk. All right. It's just that simple. Yes. I would love for you to hop on, just jump and do it the most optimal scientific way. But this is a very general way. If you're like, I just don't want to do science. I don't give a fuck about science. I just want something that's going to work. This will work five to 10 minutes, build up to five minutes, then build up to 10 minutes, then build up to 15 minutes every single day, five to six days out the week, and then do dunk sessions three to four days out the week. There you go. You're done. You're welcome. Hit thrust C tier, B tier, C tier, B tier, C tier better than I don't feel like like trying to to rank it. Um, just develop strength and glute. It's good for beginners. Like if you're a beginner, you don't know how to activate your glute. A single leg uh, hip thrust or a regular barbell hip thrust, decent, but not gonna really develop explosiveness. It could be. I'll put it at the top of C tier because I have seen some research recently saying it's really really good for your vertical jump. Like it's like low key like one of the best lifts for your vertical jump, especially two foot jumping because you are using glutes as extensors and even one foot jumping too. Um, because you are you're using the glute as an extension. And um, you're loading that movement very, very well, especially in a kind of like a, I wouldn't say joint angle specific because it's not really using a lot of joints, but kind of angle specific, or I guess it would be joint angle specific in a smaller range of motion. So yeah, uh, we'll actually go better deep squats. I changed my mind mid thing. Next tier, box drop med ball throw. So this is where you drop off a box and throw a med ball really high. We'll probably put it closer to the top of S tier. I even low key might put S plus. No, cause it's not better than reaction tag or just tag. But then, like, where should I put tag? You know what? We'll put it later. We'll figure it out later. Um, so it's the same thing as a def jump, same thing as a drop jump. You're dropping off a box, multiplying your weight, handling that weight, reversing, reversing it with the stress running cycle, but now we're adding more power to it. So some people might call it a Viking med ball toss or like a Viking def jump, but you're adding more power to a regular def jump. There you go. Boom. All right. It's just like low-key the perfect exercise. It's not not a lot to say. It's really good for developing the stress running cycle and reversal strength and getting out the amortization phase, especially when you add load to it. You'll multiply at a faster rate because you're, instead of being 160 pounds, now you have a 20 pound med ball, you're 180 pounds. So your weight's multiplying even more. So you have to handle even more forces and throw up the force with power, right? This is actually a single A def jump. So we're gonna move this down to A tier. Because the ground contact times are too slow, it's just really not that good. It's more of a strength exercise, but um, it could be really good for two foot jumps. So when you're doing fast, elastic two foot jumps, two foot plyometrics, 
that will transfer more to your one foot bounce. And when you're doing single leg jumps or more power dominant, knee dominant exercises like these right here, knee dominant jumps, knee dominant lifts, those are going to transfer well to your one, I mean, two foot uh, jump in acceleration sprint speed. But the fast elastic stuff will transfer to two foot jumps, but these are going to be max velocity sprinting, one foot jump dominant stuff, right? Stuff that will improve that, right? But still just general explosive, you still need this. Like you should not avoid this. If you're like, I'm just a two foot jumper and I need to improve acceleration. I'm not going to do any of these. Still do them. Still do them. And it's not all these like, right? It's eccentric. It's an eccentric focus exercise. When you're damaging the muscle a lot, that develops more muscle. You're building more hypertrophy. More hypertrophy is armor. Armor is hypertrophy. Strength is hypertrophy, right? Strength is armor. Hypertrophy is armor. This is preventing injuries, not developing force production. Eccentrics, slow eccentrics do not develop force production. They develop force absorption. And the hamstrings are a big force absorber for max velocity sprinting and one foot jumps and even two foot jumps. But guess what? The velocity is too slow to transfer. If you're doing these slow Nordic eccentrics, so you're doing like those five second lowers where you're trying to get your, your, your chest to touch it, like with the Tyree Kill video, right? It's too slow. It'll never transfer too fast plyometric based exercises, jumping, 5 5 basketball, sprinting, it's too slow. Research shows that strength is velocity specific. So this is flat out too slow. I'm sorry. I've, I'm sorry to hurt your dreams. All right, triple broad jump S tier. This is like almost paired up with hill sprints. We're actually moved, dropped up a little more farther down because these two exercises, uh, this is just too superior. Drops up is definitely farther down. Triple broad jump, you're going for distance, is great for horizontal power. Uh, acceleration really good if you don't have hills like you legit just cannot buy a sled you cannot fork up the money to buy a sled you cannot find a hill replace it with triple broad jumps and if you can get a band banded triple broad jumps are even better but that kind of if you can't do band resistance or sled resistance you can't do hill sprints then just triple broad jumps it's very similar type of effects or if you can't sprint like let's say it's like snowing outside triple broad jumps go do it in your basement or on your first floor you're not gonna break nothing what are these um extensive skips so where do I have, we'll put these in A tier, okay? Extensive skips is going to develop, oh my God, these are, it's kind of hard because this is a general explosiveness tier list, but for like general athleticism, that's like S plus tier, I'm not gonna lie. Extensive skips, so think of doing an A skip for five minutes straight. What you guys usually do is A skips for 10 yards, 20 yards as your warm up. Think about doing it for five minutes straight. The amount of ankle stiffness and elasticity you're going to develop is going to be through the fucking roof, all right? I can't even explain more. It's the same benefits as jump rope, but you're adding horizontal momentum. So it's going to be a way higher transfer to one foot jumping and two foot jumping because it's going to help make your your tendon adapt to horizontal velocity, which means you can decelerate and bring in more speed. You decelerate better, bring in more speed. It's got one foot jump, help the pop off, right? That, that I, I want that pop off the ground. I want that elasticity off the ground. You know, it, it, sound, it looks like a kangaroo. You're just like, boom, 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 boom. This is a great exercise, okay? That's, I, I don't even really, I don't. Like, I really want to put an S tier. Like, I think it's one of the best things. But for raw explosiveness, like, technically, it doesn't develop raw explosiveness. But for general athleticism, S plus. It low-key is, like, top five. What is this? Karaoke? Top of C tier. Another extensive exercise. I, okay. Another extensive exercise. Still really good for developing ankle stiffness and elasticity in the tendon. And the Achilles tendon is what I'm talking about. You're teaching hip flips, which is really important for just general athleticism. For general athleticism, it's probably A or S tier. Extensive, five minutes, 10 minutes straight of just nonstop karaoke. Really good. Also, too, for reducing ankle sprains is a really, really good one. If you, you struggle with ankle sprains, I think it's like in the research, 60% of ankle sprains come from lateral ankle turns, right? So if your ankle is straight and it turns laterally, those are where I think 60 or it could even be 90. I know it's above 60 for sure. It was where 60% of ankle sprains come from. It's from lateral sprains, right? So you're exposing your ankle to lateral forces. So lateral forces at velocity, which is where you get ankle sprains, is when you land. So high velocities, you're exposing the tendon in the ankle and those small muscles in the ankle, the fascial muscles, the fascia, to those forces. So really good for injury prevention. That would be like S tier for injury prevention. What is this? Lateral sprints. We'll go. We can put this in slow motion, and you're gonna you're gonna understand that you actually produce force laterally in 90% of situations. Look at how he moves side to side first. You don't go straight. And this is the same thing in track. You don't ever go straight when you're producing force at the start, right? When does he actually move? Look at this. This is kind of a weird example because obviously it's like, you know, it's, it's football. So he has to get around the person and shift them first. But it's the same thing in track and field or a 40 yard dash. Look at that. You, when you're trying to go straight, you're always going to go lateral. Your feet naturally go lateral to go forward. So lateral sprints develops the lateral glute and lateral shins and hamstrings and quads 
right? The, the explosiveness portion of that. So it's actually really, really important for the first like three steps. Even him going first, like his first step, I can't get a good video of it. Oh, we could actually see it a little bit like faster. Look at this. Let's just take it off of, I was trying to be smart, but I'm not smart. Either way, look at how he's exploding. He's going laterally. He has to go around someone. So it's kind of a bad example, but same thing in trap. You're going to produce force laterally and you're going to flail. Your legs are going to flail and there's nothing wrong with that. You're not easy to run like a robot. Lateral bounds or skater jumps, some might call it. We'll go B tier. Go B tier. Um, I think it's a little overrated. Some people kind of over. It depends on the sport, right? For general explosiveness, I think it's B tier. But for change direction, it could be S tier, right? You're just developing explosiveness in the lateral glute, which once again is really good for acceleration because your first couple steps are going to be very lateral. And then as you keep building up momentum, it's going to be very, very linear. You're not going to be moving side to side as much, but you're going to be rotating more at the core, at the upper body, the torso will be rotating like this. But your your glutes are not going to be rotating that much. But in the first acceleration, this could be really important. For general explosiveness, okay. Band resist repeat jumps. We're gonna put this in S plus. Band resist repeat jumps. There, there's a difference, all right? People don't know what I'm talking about. There's a difference. Band resisted jumps. I want you guys to see how fire this type of jump is. There's a certain setup I'm talking about. Right here, you put the bands above your shoulders and then you jump for max height. You try to jump as high as possible, six to eight reps, three to four sets. He's not doing it right. You want to keep going, right? So I wonder if PGF has something on this. PGF have something? Perfect. There we go. Homemade Vertimax. This right here, right? You see the repeat jumps. Let's, can, I, can I keep going back up? Look, at this is developing extensiveness in the patellar tendon, developing the stretch shortening cycle, reversal strength, general power, raw explosiveness. It's literally like, honestly, it's top three. It's like low key top three. It's, it, 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 it will make one of the biggest changes in your force production you will ever see. It is better than a squat. It is better than a quarter squat. It is better than a deep squat. If you are struggling with force production, you cannot produce force at fast rates. This honestly, like low key a second, is low key second. I, I don't wanna make changes because I need to, I'm, I'm being hype, I'm like being excited right now, but once I can like calm down, it low key might be second. This exact setup though, you cannot do the ones with the hands. You need to put it around your shoulders with a band, not dumbbells. Dumbbells is A tier. This is S plus for a reason, all right? Um, this will be one of the biggest changes to your vertical jump you probably will ever see. I'm not gonna rank it yet though. I definitely is above bounds though, definitely above bounds. Some some track and field uh, coaches might hate me. KOT squats, F tier. Oh yeah, I'm on it today. I'm on it today. KOT squats, F tier. I don't even wanna explain this. I don't care if I get hate for being like disingenuous. I, I don't care. Why do I have to explain this? You're overloading the quads. Right? The position's cool actually from for hypertrophy. This low key could be like S tier for the quad. For like quad hypertrophy, low key S tier. For explosiveness, nothing. It doesn't do anything. You're pushing your knee way too far above the toe. That's gonna give you shin splints and patella tendonitis. All right, especially if you already have knee pain, you're you're just asking for more more knee pain. You're you're putting too much compression on the knee. And then for explosiveness, what are you doing? It's an eccentric based exercise, a slow eccentric. So we already know that doesn't transfer to your sprint speed or jump. The research is completely conflicted on that. You only fast eccentric transfer. So slow eccentric, so what? Slow eccentric, what's the purpose? Hypertrophy and muscle building and armor, like we talked about earlier. So if your your goal is hypertrophy, muscle training, and our muscle building and armor, then this isn't good for ex explosiveness. Like hypertrophy is for durability, not explosiveness. Unless you're a beginner. But even if you're a beginner, if you want to de develop a balanced lower leg, you don't want a quad dominant exercise. You want a, 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 a deep squat, a balanced exercise for the quads, the glutes, and the hamstrings. Deep squats is one of the best things for your hamstrings and your quads. A balanced exercise. This is terrible. I don't, I don't even know. It doesn't develop force production. It doesn't develop force absorption. It's just nothing. It just, all it does is knee pain. You're just asking for knee pain. Apparently, it's supposed to save your knees, but it gives you knee pain. It's too much compression on the knee. You're pushing your knee too far forward, and you're compressing the knee too much. Don't even talk about it. if you're tall. If you're above six feet, you're just asking for knee pain. If your limbs are too long, you're putting your knee through too much range of motion, especially if you have knee pain, you're asking for more knee pain. I'm sorry, KLT. I don't hate you, bro. I don't hate you. I'm not going to say your name. I don't hate you. You know I don't hate you. F tier hip flexor training. Man, I have, oh my horrible hip flexor lifts. Banded, kettlebell, dumbbell. The only, if it's cable and you're going through a full range of motion, I'll put C tier. I'll put D tier because we're talking about general explosiveness. If you are training in only a short range of motion, which is anything with a band or a kettlebell or a dumbbell, it is F tier. It does nothing, okay? People, your hip flexor is not as important for sprinting as people like would think, right? So let's look at a sprint. Sprint gate. And I'm going to explain to you why your hip flexors are not what you think they are. Look at a sprint, all right? 
When you're sprinting, you're producing force down, right? The ankle's down. Look at this. He's doing a low intensity, so this is actually kind of a bad example. All right, look, this is perfect. You're pushing down. You're not driving your knee up, right? To produce force into the ground, you have to produce force down. And if you want your stride to open up and you want bigger, like your knees to come up higher, you have to get vertical displacement, which means vertical displacement is force production. You need to get off the ground. Your knees can't come up high if you're not in the air, okay? So what's a, what's a sprinting gait cycle? Look at this. Your knee cannot come up off the ground if you're not in the air. So if you produce force down into the ground, then your knees naturally gonna come up with the gait cycle. Now, what people do is they think knees up, and this is where hip flexors are important. Oh, I need hip flexors comes from, I need to sprint with my knees up. But guess what happens when you forcefully push your knees up, which he's not doing, so it's gonna be hard. I'm just gonna have to explain it with my mouse, is you're not producing force into the ground, you're producing force into the air. You're kicking nothing, kicking nothing, which guess where this happens? So when you shoot your knees up, what happens is your knee overextends, which means you're going to reach because you shot your knees up instead of switching under your center of mass. So when you reach, instead of landing under your center of mass, which is under his pelvis, you're gonna land right here, which is overstriding. And when you overstride, guess what happens? That's negative forces. Your shin is going this way, this angle, negative, which means you're decelerating. You're decelerating. So if you shoot your knees up, if you go high knees, like you like those dumb ass fucking high school coaches, just do high knees, high knees, high knees, high knees, drive the knees up higher. Guess what? You're gonna overextend. And if you don't overextend, you put so much energy into drive your knees up, you don't drive your knees to the ground. You're not producing force. So you don't need stronger hip flexors. My knees aren't getting high enough. I need stronger hip flexors. I'm burning out the last 100 meters of a 400 meter sprint or an 800 or a 200. I'm burning out at the end. I need stronger hip flexors. No, you need to produce more force, dumbass. Put force into the fucking ground. It's just that simple. Strengthening your hip flexors don't do anything. You're driving down. Everything is always down. The only time you might ever drive your knees up is in acceleration, you might drive your knees forward. I can understand why some coaches might say that, like drive your knee forward versus like just down, down, down. I can understand that. But other than that, there's no excuse for not driving your knee down. You were never driving your knee up. You're not purposely activating your hip flexor. Your hip flexor is a part of the gait cycle. It comes up from vertical displacement. The only time your hip flexor activates and turns on and drives up is when you're in the air. If you're not in the air, you don't need your hip flexor. Oh yeah, that's, I'm saying that wrong. I'm not explaining that correctly. But if you're not in the air, you're not gonna utilize your hip flexor correctly. So guess what? If your knees are not coming up high enough and it bothers you, produce more force. Get off the ground. Try dunking a basketball off one foot. Your knee's going to fly up in the air because you're trying to jump as high as possible. It's almost the same as sprinting. When you sprint, your knees, you're producing so much force into the ground, your knees are gonna come up, just like you were trying to dunk a basketball. You don't have to tell yourself to drive your knee up during a, during a one foot jump. And if you're telling yourself that, that's probably why you can't jump high. I might not explain that well, but I'm irritated. I'm like 30 minutes in and there we go. Fast feet, F tier. This doesn't develop fast switch fibers. It doesn't develop rate of force development. It's not a stimulus to the central nervous system. The only thing, okay, that's wrong, that's wrong. It does activate your central nervous system. It's a very good way to wake up. So for a warm up, this low key could be A tier. But for general explosiveness, for actually developing and delivering, making your body adapt to something, you don't adapt to anything. There's no stimulus besides turning on your central nervous system. You're not producing force. You're not sprinting forward. You're not developing horizontal power, vertical power. You're not. You're not doing anything. You're not absorbing force. The only thing I could think that it could be useful for is once again turning on his nervous system. Is like good for a warm up. And it could be good for like developing like some context in the ankle, right? Like extensibility in the tendon, the Achilles tendon. So, but if we're gonna, if that's the goal, we just do jump rope or skipping, extensive skipping. We don't need to do extensive fast feet. You're just burning yourself out. It doesn't do anything. You're literally not moving. And even the ladder drills, like any type of ladder drill, you're not doing anything. You're not producing force. Just because it looks fast doesn't mean you're gonna get faster. You're not producing force. Speed is about producing force at fast rates, not moving your feet at fast rates. People like Usain Bolt are producing four or five times their body weight in force. They're not moving their feet fast and chopping their feet in the ground. They're producing force. This shit doesn't do anything, all right? I already have triple jump. I don't know why this is here. Again, can I delete this? Triple broad jump? We'll just play at the bottom. I already have that, my bad. Dumbbell resisted repeat jumps. We're gonna play A tier. So banner resist is S plus tier, but A tier for dumbbell. Right, so it's the same benefits, but because there's not enough accommodating resistance at the top, you don't get the same benefits in the stretch running cycle. But you really get a lot of good force production benefits, and because there's more tension at the top, it's it more tension at the top with the bands, 
it's much more transferable to actual vertical jump where you're trying to produce the most force at the peak. So it's better for like peak rate of force development and peak power, but this is just good for general explosive. It's not bad. It's A tier. It's, it's not bad. And honestly, if we're going to rank it, I put it above med ball throw. I put it above single leg death jump. Oh, I don't know why single leg death. What am I doing? I actually, yeah, let's just move this around real quick. Lateral sprints. Lateral sprints definitely above this. Broad jump. Broad jump's definitely here. Half squat, definitely above. Extensiveness. Yeah, cool. All right, something like this. Something around this. It's honestly just nuance. There, there's so much nuance, it's really hard to rank. Honestly, yeah, there's there's too much nuance for me to rank. Every program's different. Every program has its like own goals and needs and stuff like that. So it's really hard to rank exercises, to be honest. I'm more ranking off principle. What is this? What exercise is this? I think these, these are ankle hops, which is the same thing as jump rope. I'm pretty sure these are ankle hops. Same thing as jump rope. Same thing, just less coordination. Like, we'll just put it right here. Same thing, it's literally the exact same exercise as jump rope without jump rope. Just like low intensity pogos, do it for extensive times, five to 15 minutes, develops ankle stiffness, elasticity in the, in the tendon. It's really, really good. It's good. Single leg bounce, A tier, actually S tier. Really good for ankle stiffness. It's low key, it's low key S plus tier, but because it's single leg, it's so harsh on the body. Oh wait, we're not talking about, it doesn't matter how harsh it is. It's yeah, it's S plus. We don't care about if it's harsh on the body because it's just for raw explosiveness. We're looking at these as like byproducts by itself, right? Like if you were to only do this exercise, how much gains would you get? That's probably, honestly, probably the best way I should should do it. Honestly, I might add this as the intro. This tier list is going to be low key. If you only do this exercise, how much gains would you get in terms of raw explosiveness? And we do not care about injuries. Like if injuries just weren't a thing and we're just looking for main, mainly gains and you had to pick like three exercises or something, uh, I'm not going to do that. But maybe something like that, right? Something around those lines. Progressive bounds better than regular alternate bounds. We'll put yeah, progressive bounds. So this is vertical chancy bounds, which means you go left, right the first time, then left, left, right, right, then left, 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 which means you bound left, 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 like single leg bound three times on the left and then three times on the right. And then left, 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 which is four. I just said it like five times, but left on four times and right four times. So it's like single leg bounds, but you're alternating the sides. Honestly, this low key could be top three, depending on who you're talking to. It could be top two, but all S plus, honestly, like any of these could be like top three. Like it's too hard to rank. In my opinion, it's 5 5 basketball and resistance sprints, but it's too hard to rank. What is this? 10 meter flies, S plus. We gotta put some of these into S. We'll put this in S right here. I can't have just a thousand S pluses. This is S, because this is a mix of both. Like these are, this is literally both in one, right? It's, it's just so intense. 10 meter flies, easily, easily S plus. Some people hate on 10 meter flies. I don't understand why. Like there's some vertical jump coaches who are like, it's a waste of time. I don't think so. If you're timing it, it's one of the best stimuluses for raw explosiveness and max velocity. It develops so much stiffness in the ankle. Really good for one foot jumps, jumpers. I, I just, the ground contact times are so fast. It's such a good stimulus for a stress running cycle. I just, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I think it's just, it's common sense. Dunk attempts, I put it the same here. Like dunk attempts and just max over jumps, the exact same thing, right? They, it's just a great stimulus for vertical jump. It's very sport specific, which is exactly what you want. If you want to jump higher, you should be jumping. There's more of a skill component. So technically it's less, like it's here. It's not better than just jumping as high as possible and touching something, but it's it's amazing. It's perfect. And then the top of S will be low, uh, not the top of S, we'll do second in S will be low rim dunking. If you're struggling with dunking, go low rim dunk. If you can't dunk on a 10 foot, dunk on a, a nine foot and do windmills, try out new things. This is one of the best things for developing. Honestly, it's like, imagine if you're doing extensive skips, but you deal with the basketball and dunking. It's like the most ex most sport specific, extensive exercise you could do. You could do lower in dunks for like 30 minutes and you get great gains in terms of like the tendon adaptation level. You can adapt to the angles you need to co-contract that, decelerate that and all that. Um, it's really good. It's just, it's honestly amazing. I already have a def jump here. I don't know why I have another one. Oh, I, I don't have a regular def jump. All right, def jump will go he here because it's not better than Viking, but it's better than hurdle hop. It's not better than hurdle jumps. Okay, def jump. A plain old def jump, really intensive on the central nervous system in the body. You're teaching your body how to get the amortization phase, reverse the strength out, developing the stress cycle, improves their uh, reactive strength index, really good. Isometric lunge, will blow D tier. So I actually promote the isometric lunge a lot, right, for health, for knee health. But for general explosiveness, it doesn't develop explosiveness like that. In, um, at a basic level, like it develops the amortization phase, which is you, there's, there's, a, there's a portion of jumping and sprinting when your tendon locks up, right? It's called the amortization phase. 
So you heard me talk about that a couple times. You need to be strong in that phase or your knee's gonna give out. So if you're weak in the amortization phase or you're isometric weak, then your knee's going to give out. Think about bringing in a bunch of speed and you jump and you dunk. And the next time you're like, let me just bring in more speed. And when you bring in more speed, you just legs just give out, like your knee just collapse. That's being isometrically weak or weak in the amortization phase of the jump, which is when your tendon locks up for like literally milliseconds. It's, it's, so, it's so fast, you can't even look at it, you can't see it. But it locks up for like milliseconds and then it goes into the concentric phase. All right, there you go. Single leg, single leg RDL, we'll go D tier, but we'll put it behind here. It's good for some balance and stability, but if we're trying to train balance and stability, we could do that with other exercises. It doesn't really do anything for explosiveness. I mean, I guess you could say like, it could teach some movement patterns that are important, like a hinge is really important. And then like extension at the glute is important too. So like there is some benefits, but I don't really see the purpose in terms of um, explosiveness. Maybe acceleration, not sure. I personally, I program it, but for like health, like to teach a hinge, right? Time sprints, we're gonna put, this is hard. It's kind of the same thing, but we'll go time sprints better than 40 yard, S plus. 40 yard is very specific. Like if you wanna get better at the 40 yard, you need to run 40 yards. But time sprints is just like, honestly, actually time sprints is second. Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. Time sprints, so the best type of time sprints is recording or FAT. If you wanna learn how to time a sprint with a phone, all you need to do is set up your phone on some type of concrete or have someone record you, but if you can't, put two cones up, all right? So let's say you run 30 meters or 30 yards. You put the cone up at the start line, you put the cone up at the 30 yard line, and then find a place where you can somehow set up your phone with a shoe, like, and just, even if it's a weird angle, and then start the recording. And then once you go to the cone, it should be able to capture both sides of the cone, by the way. Once you get to the cone, the second you release from the cone, that's when the timer starts. And you can do that by clicking the edit on your phone and like scrolling to, to shorten the time. Like if you're gonna trim the time, you can see the actual time, right? So you, the second you make a movement, like your, your, usually your hand moves backwards or your foot moves backwards first. The second that movement starts, that's when the timer starts. And the second your hip passes the second cone, right? The finish line cone, that's when the timer stops. That's how you time yourself, FAT. That's technically, it's not technically FAT, but it's, it's laser timing, right? It's as close to laser timing as you get. Hand timing is complete bullshit. I know it says a hand timer, it's not hand timer. I'm talking about FAT laser timing or recorded timing, like camera recorded timing. It's one of the best stimuluses you can get for raw explosiveness. It's, you can improve through auto regulation, through, auto regulation is the biggest thing, right? I'm having a, a mind blank. It's just the same thing as a 40 yard, but it's timed, it's it's specific. It's um auto regulation. What the fuck am I trying to look for? What, what word am I looking for? Max intent, You're because you're because you're recording the time and you're looking at the time you're trying to beat it, you're getting max intent and max intent, which, oh my God, fuck, that makes this low key so much higher. And then it, yeah, if we're talking about max intent, then this is a whole different list. Max intent is one of the biggest things for improving explosiveness. If you drive, if you squat with max intent, you try to drive the bar up as fast as possible, you sprint as fast as possible, 110%, you're gonna get a completely different stimulus to the central nervous system than going 95%. I'm not trolling, if you sprint a PR, that is one of the most hardest stimulus, and stimulus is as good, hard stimulus is good to the nervous system for getting faster, for an adaptation to your nervous system. So it's an amazing stimulus, but if you sprint 95% of your one rep, uh, your your 30 yard t uh, PR, right? So if you run a 40 yard, right? If you want a 4.6 and you even run 5% slower than 4.6, right? So someone do the math, I don't know. What's calc, right? So if you run a four, you run a 4.6, right? Times what? What is it? 0 0.5, 0 0.05 plus 4.6. So if you run 5% slower and you run a 4.83, that is actually conditioning. You're not giving yourself a stimulus to your body to develop explosiveness. So the reason why timing so good is you can auto-regulate. You sprint, you just say, we're running 10, 30 yards today. And the second I run 5% slower than my PR, we're done for sprints for today. That is one of the best stimuluses you can get to improve sprint speed, vertical jump, and raw explosiveness. All right, I explain that terribly because I'm starting to get really tired, so I'm sorry, but hopefully that makes sense. Auto regulation and max intent are really important, and this is one of the biggest drivers for improving your sprint speed, okay? Same thing when, I, when I'm saying max intent, jumping for a goal. Everything needs to have a goal. When you're trying to dunk during a 5v5 session, you need to dunk with a goal. You want to dunk. When you're jumping, you need to touch something. You need to jump over a high jump. You need to dunk something. When you're sprinting, you're trying to run a time. When you're doing resistance sprints, that's why I like low-key, I could put it down here. But honestly, because it's just too good. 
but you're dunking like dunk sessions you're going for a goal that's why these are down here because there's no goal right there's not an actual goal you're just trying to jump by it but if you measure these then these are all s plus plus if you measure in time and try to figure out what's your jump height on these you're dunking for a goal you're trying to touch a tennis ball on the ceiling you're trying to touch the ceiling you're jumping as hard as possible sprinting as hard as possible these are all s plus plus like a completely new tier max intent is really important and then when you get lower and lower max intent kind of doesn't matter and that's why you start to see for raw explosiveness i didn't even think about this until now just off of like my like i don't want to blow myself up but off my knowledge the lower you go the harder you try you don't get the same benefits right if you try to lift tib raises really hard that's not a good benefit for it's not a stimulus right if you try to do lunges really hard how do you do a max intent lunge you can't and then the higher you go up you start to realize oh max intent really matters you're doing a high pull you're driv you're driving the high pull really hard you're doing a single leg death jump and jumping as high as possible you're measuring your broad jump right when you start thinking like i just did this naturally because this is how important max intent is you're throwing a med ball as high as possible you're jumping doing repeat jumps trying to jump as high as possible you're doing court squats you're doing as heavy weight as possible in a in a small position drop jumps you're trying to get off the ground as fast as possible like all these things as possible as hard as possible these are all max intent and that's it's so important i did it naturally that's how important max intent is in my brain for explosiveness if you're training like a bitch you will get bitch results i'm probably cutting that out the video i shouldn't have said that okay <laughs> sorry i didn't mean that in a disrespectful way i just said i don't i'm too tired but i'm starting to just say shit i'm not gonna lie single leg squat i think is one of the best strength exercises so i'll put it right here actually yeah and then a single leg jump is really good it's actually like low key, like top of B tier. We're actually gonna put this top of B tier. Develops acceleration, and then the jump version, the single leg jump, is actually really good for uh, knee dominant patellar tendon extensibility, like extensive tendon strength in the patellar tendon. So honestly, it's B tier. It low key is like bottom A tier, but because it's a strength exercise, it's kind of hard. But is this like a, oh, I think it's a broad jump to a sprint. I kind of don't wanna cover that. Single leg calf raise, it's definitely above, but it's below any type of jump variation. So that's, I put it here right it's more specific because it's on a single leg so you're going to load up less you're going to compensate less and you're going to utilize a lot more of the the miniature muscles in the foot and in the calf the gastroc you can even do soleus right which honestly i want to do a soleus raise but i'll talk about that later i'll just probably put in like b tier as well but yeah just more specific calf raise kind of same things i talked about with the calf raise but just more spe specifics is a little bit better but it still will never be better than any plyometric exercise which if i'm going with that route but I don't think these are good for raw explosiveness. So I'm, it's a little inconsistent with what I'm talking about, but I'm still going to stick with it. Where are these standing skips? I'm not going to cover this. No point. Same thing as jump rope. Trap bar deadlift. We'll put it with right here. Just because of how you can manipulate it, right? So we'll actually put it right here. Uh, no, 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 no. What am I talking about? I'm literally chatting. And honestly, I'm low-key low being a goofball. Okay. If I order this and you're complaining about the order, I'm low-key all over the place. It's too hard because it's there's too much nuance to a program to really order anything. So low-key kind of doesn't, the order low-key doesn't matter at all. Trevor Adelif, you can manipulate it. You can go really, really heavy, go really, really light. It's low-key like one of the most versatile exercises in the world. Like I could low-key put an S plus tier if it was like versatility. Like you only have one exercise, what would you pick? I'd put it like S plus, like top three. It's just so much benefits. So many things you could do with it. You could jump with it. You could do high pulls. You could do regular strength. You can do a hinge variation, a knee dominant variation, a um, hamstring variation, and that's it. There's my tier list. Let's uh, let's order these a little bit better. If the goal is max intent, which is the most important thing for raw explosiveness, then a couple of these are going to change because I low-key forgot about that. A couple of these are going to change then. Then we'll put this here. We'll put this here. We'll put, since this is more extensibility, we're going to put this down, but I still think it's really, really important. I think it's a missing key for a lot of people. So don't, don't get that mixed up. And we'll put this at the top okay then i still think this is really important i know i'm pushing it down but i think like every program should have it okay it's just it's the purpose of this video is raw explosiveness we'll put this here hill sprints obviously you're gonna go up it's sprinting i mean what am i doing there's no horizontal momentum it's not even a question chill with broad jump is gonna go up here if this is death jump to a like to a dunk it's s plus all right if you're doing a death jump to a goal like a tennis ball or a dunk it's s plus but a regular death jump with no goal it's it's down here all right just a regular death jump is down here drop jump same thing quarter squats max intent doesn't matter but this is actually perfect this is fine you could mix these two right this is good still you can even put these up here but because it's a strength exercise i'm not going to put it above all these biometrics this is also a strength exercise but it's so specific that i think it's really good ceiling like death jump i look you don't like it that much i just overhyped it i think this is amazing it's not you can't really max intent it because it's oh wait no these are skips for height right 
No, this just skips for a sensibility. Damn, I'm being a little inconsistent right now, but I'm just gonna stick with it. Yeah, this is perfect is not the right word. There is no perfect. I'm very flawed as a human and as a coach, but I have great results. I think this is a lot of the things you'll see in my program. Like if you get just jump, you're on the speed academy, you're on just sprint. There's a lot of stuff you'll see in the program. And I think it's solid. I think overall, like at a general concept, like for raw explosiveness, we're not thinking about durability. We're just saying like, if you had like three exercises, you just need to develop raw explosiveness. These will probably do it. <laughs> this would probably do it if you just pick some of these. I wouldn't suggest picking some of these. Progressive overload is really important in strength and in play, but just by itself, it's decent. I think it's okay. This is not how you would see a program. You're not gonna see all high level, high intensity plyometrics. This, I would not program this. Do not pick these exercises and just tomorrow, just do all these for three sets of 20. I'm not gonna get rep ranges for these because I don't want people just to pick exercises and start doing them. So I'm not giving sets and reps, but generally if you do pick these, lower reps is better. You want to be fresh, you want to be explosive. You want high rest in between sets. We're not grinding. When we're trying to develop explosiveness, it's about high rest, high intensity, right? So you don't want to do, you know, reps to failure. You don't want to do 30 band resisted jumps because you're just going to develop slow switch fibers. You want to develop fast switch fibers. And that's only comes from being fresh. Do not pick these exercises and just do them. You need a program. If you're like, what do I do? I have a free workout that pairs a lot of these exercises and also the strength movements too, not just all the S pluses, the strength movements and the, the calf raises and all the, even maybe low key, one of these type of shitty ass exercises together and actually put it into a well-balanced science-based program to get you durable, strong, and explosive at the most effective weight possible. If you pick all these exercises, you will get explosive, but you also get injured very fast. It's too aggressive. It's way too aggressive. It's too harsh on the body. Besides five, five basketball, that's why it's number one. These two are harsh on the body, but you could do it so much that it makes it so, like so good. Like you could do this like crazy, but these are also really, really potent on the X. That's actually such a great way to explain it. Oh my God. These are really good, right? The bounding and hurdle hops and the death jumps, all these variations are really fucking good for jumping higher, running faster, but they're so harsh on the body. You can't spam them. You can spam this. You can play five, five every day. You can sprint every day. You really can. You can jump every day with a goal until you get tired every single You could do these, all these, not all these. You could do these, like the top five every single day. But the second you start going lower, these are still really good. Like they're honestly the same as this, but you can't do them every day. You will get injured. You will hurt yourself eventually. Overuse injuries will come. Tears might not come when you play basketball every day. Tears probably won't come when you sprint every day. Unless you get really fast, you're like 10-4. Then you shouldn't be sprinting every day. But if you're slow, you could low-key sprint every day. You can low-key jump every day. You can't jump high. Second you start jumping high, you probably need to cut back. There you go. Cool. Hope you guys enjoyed. Check out just Jamar. Check out my Instagram. I'm a high-level coach who's trained a lot of good guys. Right? Trained some 10.4 guys. I know what I'm talking about. Excuse me. 